Hi everybody, um, this is Pam Coey and I'm in my studio. My background is so boring compared to Lorna Crane who is in Australia and uh, I am, I'm so thrilled to have her here and introduce you to her on my channel. It's, um, it's really special to have her and the reason that we're, we're connecting here is we're going to be doing a workshop together in New Zealand in 2020. So this is Lorna Crane. She's from Pambula, Australia. She's been a working artist since the 1980s. And so here she is. Here's Lorna. Hi, Lorna. Hi, Pam. Thank you for doing this. And I can't wait to work with you next year in New Zealand. Yes. Um, I've been a working artist since the early 80s when I went to art school in Wollongong on the just south of Sydney, New South Wales. Um, but now I live in a, um, in a very small coastal, rural coastal town, four kilometres from the ocean, which is just really beautiful and not far from the Victorian border. Um, I'm here in my studio now. Um, I built it when we moved down here in 2003. It's just a really rustic shed, which I adore, and it's 10 metres by 7 metres. I'm just going to turn it around now so you can get an idea of my oh, studio. Please, please. So um, my studio is looks down, looks down to a historic homestead called The Grange, um, uh, dating back to the 1800s, which I really lovely. So I look onto 15 acres. My working space is seven metres by seven metres. So you can kind of get to see That's the space nice. there now. Very beautiful. Um, I like to work on tables because I, I was always working on kitchen tables because I didn't have studio spaces. So my, I've got a very flexible art space that sort of moves around all of the time. You've got to excuse the mess here at the moment because I've just <laughs> returned from looking after my daughter for nearly two months now. Um, one of my big, my big uh, brushes there that's hanging from the rafters. Um, what I love about my studio is that I have to walk down to my space. So that's my house there. Okay. So it's um, just a little three-bedroom bungalow. But I love, love the fact that I can walk down to my studio. And again, it's a big mess in here at the moment, but this is where I do a lot of cloth work, some storage, and there's a bathroom there. Um, oh. A lot of things are on wheels, so I can easily walk around. Um, it seems very spacious and very well lit. Yeah, it's real. Oh, there's no lights on at the moment, so it's all natural at the moment. I'm working on a big project at the moment, which is a, which is a fiber fiber work. Um, this is all little works in progress, and it's um, for me, I'm I'm more a painter than a fiber. Always, I'm a, I'm a bit of a closet fiber artist. So I came out about five years ago by doing a lot of contemporary cloth work. So, but I still love pushing. I like to push the limits by using like tarlatan. I've got tarlatan here that um, use tarlatan. I've got handmade paper. I'm really you know, like, like just pushing it as far as I can go and using cloth that has been, that has been um, dipped into a lake and letting it kind of rot. And I like that kind of like perfect, imperfect, wabi-sabi sort of feel. With this one here, I'm using cement pigments on a vintage kimono cloth, but I love, you know, I love the, the, the front of it, but right. I love the black of it as well and just sort of exploring what I can actually do with the fibre. Mm -hmm. I've decided like I love this section here as well where I've started using my handmade um, ink which is a Pambula brew that I used so mm -hmm. using um, using eucalyptus leaves and um, and that's actually been in my studio now for, for a couple of months so it's had the natural light coming in and that, that is, that's still looking really quite good. But I'm now going to start drawing back into it. Right, so there's ink that actually comes from a eucalyptus leaf that's that dark. It's almost black. Yeah, well this is organza. So I've la I'm layering all of these. So oh. this is a layer of organza over the top of a piece that I'd hand dyed a long time ago. Mm -hmm. This is just with a marker. So I really like to push whatever, a bit like you, Pam. I like, I like yeah. to use a variety of mediums. So just using an oil, oil mm -hmm. pastel here, 
drawing over the top of it. So I don't want to lose my integrity as, a, as an artist by just being a purist with, you know, fibre work. You know, I'm layering, like down here, you can see I'm layering with the organza with the pigments and I'm overlaying it with the tarlatan, which is what you use to, to wipe off etching plates. And then over painting it with ink as well. I've just I've just done that grid work there just to hold it together, but I quite like the grid as well. Up here you can see where I've kind of started stitching it together a little bit more. And oh. I'm using paint swatches up there as well. So and it will be cool. Yeah. So it's um, yeah. It's around and about two metres. So if you can kind of look at it like that yeah. in context oh. of there's a big easel. I see. Okay. So are you are you stitching your hand stitching and choosing your different colored threads and things like that? Yeah, I'm going to do it'll probably like this is just like um, a work in progress of just putting the little samples up at the moment and just seeing well, you know, how am I going to put it all together? Yes. And that will start over the next couple of or in the new year, I'll I'll just work intensely with it. Like this one here is just some beautiful um, acrylic ink that I've used. And then I've washed it. And this is just a simple drop cloth that a painter will use to put on the floor. I love working with the drop cloth. Yeah. But then after you've washed it, it becomes really quite soft and beautiful. And I'm, I'm really enjoying it. But then when you layer it here with the organza, it yeah. just has this lovely sort of a, a sophistication about it that, yeah. you know, it, it, there's a mystery of, you know, you want to be able to what lies, you know, what lies beneath. And, you know, yeah. I, I find that really, really fascinating. So. Oh, that's um, wonderful. And, uh, yeah, so your studio, did you build that or? Uh, it was a shed when we came here and it was full of, um, it was full of sheep poo and, and it was just, there was no concrete floor. We ended up, um, we put the concrete floor in and we put um, these windows in. So this was just an opening here where the uh, previous owner could just drive through from that angle over there yeah. and drive out through here and then drive up, you know, drive up through there. So right. it was, um, yeah, so... What a major improvement. <laughs> Beautiful. So this is an idea about what this is. These are, can you see these? I can. Those are your, so for, for my audience who may not know, but Lorna Crane is internationally known for her amazing brushes, among other things. But um, the name of our upcoming workshop is um, a brush with, is it a brush with New Zealand, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is why, because, um, yeah, Lorna, you just, where, when did you make your first brush? Do you remember? Uh, it would have been this time five years ago. Five years and ago. It was after a conversation. Can I turn it around now so yes, I can? Yes, please do. Please do, yes. yeah. Yeah. We'll um, I was Go actually, I'll, I'll leave the, I'll just do this first. Yeah. I was actually teaching in, um, in Venice. I was working on these particular um, eight inch squares. Okay. Um, in Venice and I was teaching a workshop which was a mixed media collage workshop and we were doing a lot of mark making um, and overdrawing and deconstruction and reconstruction so and what I found from doing that particular project I learnt so much about just letting go and by letting go you don't have this sort of preconceived idea about or an expectation and so I learned so much about myself as an artist when I was doing all of these and okay. I hadn't taught for quite a few years and everybody said you should teach and and I said well I I used to teach a lot I'd work in my background was um, my early background was as a map maker I did land and engineering survey drafting because I had to get a real job in the 70s and then um, then I did my uh, arts courses were done in the 80s. So um, I, I, I always wanted to become an art teacher, but we ended up getting, a, I was married to a teacher at that stage and we got a, a teacher exchange to go to Canada. Oh. So I lived, in, I lived in the Niagara Peninsula in a tiny little town called Dunville near Hamilton in the Niagara Peninsula. It was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that I could come back and do my dip ed and become a teacher. 
Um, and that didn't happen because we had to pay back a lot of money. And then we moved to Canberra and I thought, great, I can go to, I can go to, you know, go and learn how to become a teacher, do my deep ed. But they had too many art trained people there. So I ended up having to go back to contract drafting. And then um, I thought, no, I really want to concentrate more on an arts, arts, on an arts career. So I, um, I ended up getting a job working with, mild, with people with mild intellectual disabilities. So I worked with them for a couple of years. And then after that, um, that funding ran out because of government changes. And I ended up um, applying for a job four months later and I worked in a psychiatric institution, 40-bed psych, psych institution, wow. um, residential. Yeah. And, and I just found that just working with people with, with um, mental health issues was just so rewarding because, you know, they, they, they were able to, to do some amazing work and... You know, they had no preconceived ideas at all and we'd do some really fun things together. Mm -hmm. Then when the institution closed, I ended up taking the program out into the community. So it was an inclusive art program. So the people that came to my classes at a local community centre, um, I had a maximum of 10 people. Seven had to identify with a mental, mental um, health illness and the others could be just other people from the community. Well, those other people were mainly nurses and teachers. So, and, oh, it was just amazing. They, we ended up going from a $5,000 budget to an $80,000 a year budget. And, oh. you know, at the end of five years, we were um, promoting Art is Great for Your Mental Health in a big major, a big major um, at the local folk, folk festival. So oh, here, here are these people that, you know, were too scared to go out and they're, they're teaching the community how to, how to make, make um, stamps and screen print and just doing an amazing amount of work. So I then got a Churchill Fellowship. So I researched community arts and mental health in 2002 and that took me to USA, Canada and, and, um, and England or at the UK and I was looking at it from in the USA I was looking at from a clinical modality so I was I was looked at I researched in Madison Wisconsin and then in um, New York and I worked with um, Dr Larry Day Professor Larry Davidson at Yale University and that was that was amazing I loved that yeah. and then up to Canada looking at it from a community arts modality and um, that was that was really interesting, but you could see the difference from when I was there in '88, where they had a different government, and then in 2002, there was just no funding for the arts, and they were really, really, really struggling with, you know, with anything that you know, you know, anything that is sort of, you know, helping people. It was more about getting them into employment rather than doing the arts. But they didn't realise that the arts is actually. You know, it's a stepping stone in building confidence, and there are so many layers to layers to you know recovery. But then I ended up going to the UK, and I researched in Colchester and Manchester and Durham. So it was incredible. But after fifteen years of working in mental health and disability, I got remarried and moved out to the coast, and decided that I don't want to teach; I just want to concentrate on my career. So. And it's been great. I've had so many opportunities by building the studio. You know, when I when I say I come to my studio, I say when I walk into my studio, I walk into me. Oh, and, that's beautiful. You know, I just, I just, I just feel at peace. My husband says, if I get cranky, go down to your studio. <laughs> I know when you when you haven't been doing it, you need to be in your studio. Yeah, oh, I know that feeling. It's a bad yeah. feeling, you know. But yeah. I have a question for you. Since you have a wonderful yeah. background, I didn't realize that you had worked with mental health people, uh, people struggling with their, you know, mental health, and um, just a broad range of people. Because, you know, what I feel is that I, I think we're all creative in our own way, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. painting or cooking or uh, quilting, you know, any any number of things we can do to be creative. but what is it about the visual arts that you've seen over the years that 
kind of transforms people. Like, you know, let's say if you have a person, you go to the mental health hospital and, um, or the psychiatric hospital, people struggling, and all of a sudden, you know, you give them some materials and it, it brings out a certain thing in them. It's not about, because I don't really think art, even in, in my case, I don't really think it's about talent. I think mm. it's about just doing something that um, yeah. is part of us, it's part of who we are. We all have that, and however we choose to express it, that's up to the individual. But what, how do you define um, what the visual arts have done for these many people that, you know, they're not, they haven't gone to art school, they, their major is not art, but what has it done for them that you saw? I think that I think that I, I realized early on, especially when I was working in the mental health in the you know in the the psych psych ward, was that you know when they walked into my space, it was a creative space that it didn't define them as having an illness, and I would always say, you know, like I have this I have this mantra of I am and I can and I do. Mm. And, you know, it doesn't matter how you do it. And that's what I love about, about how, I'm, how I'm now teaching is that there's this, when you're using a handmade brush, people are making these, these certain choices. Right. They make a choice about what handle they want to use, what mediums, or I'll direct them a little bit, but it, it's about the ownership you know, they've got to own what they do. Like, I won't work on anybody else's work. Right. I'll do it on a bit of paper on the side. Sure. I, won't, I won't touch anybody else's work because I know that when somebody has done that to me, I felt like it's their work. It's not it's my a violation, work. isn't it? Like, you yeah. feel like that it's a violation because it's not... It's not right. And yeah. so with the brushes that you make, um, and, and there's just such a wide variety... Um, tell us a little bit about, you know, you said you made your first brush about five years ago, and then how has that evolved into like... That's a really good story. 